Hey guys, and welcome to episode 92 of the OCDStories.com podcast. Now in this episode, I got back on Kimberly Quinlan. Kimberly is a therapist, and I got her back on the show because I think she has a lot to offer the world, and more importantly to you guys, the OCD community. And uh, we talk about in this particular episode, radical acceptance. Now radical acceptance is firmly rooted in Buddhist philosophy, uh, but it's also a key part of dialectical behavior therapy or DBT. Now radical acceptance, I've often talked about acceptance in the case of acceptance and commitment therapy. And this is very much similar to that first step of ACT except for it's radical and uh, or in Kimberly's own words it's badass it's sort of almost taking own, true ownership of it and, and it's as we talk about in the podcast it becomes quite an, an empowering act you're not just on the fence you're not a bystander you're taking charge of this thing uh, we talk about well, a what radical acceptance is uh, we talk about the difference between pain and suffering because there is a difference we talk about applying radical acceptance to OCD and how it might look And we talk about why accepting thoughts doesn't mean agreeing with them because, you know, none of us want to agree with those disturbing thoughts and why would we? But, you know, acceptance doesn't actually mean agreeing with them. It just means allowing them to be there without judgment and without engagement. Uh, We also talk about self-love and the importance of that Um, and just many other things. But, I mean, this, this is quite a philosophical talk, but... I think there's a lot of practical examples in there and I think you're really going to like this and hopefully it's going to be another weapon in your arsenal uh, towards mental well-being. But yeah, without further ado, here is Kimberly. On today's show, I have Kimberly Quinlan. Kimberly is a licensed marriage and family therapist who treats people with OCD and related disorders, eating disorders and body-focused repetitive disorders. She runs her own podcast called Your Anxiety Toolkit Kimberly also trained at the OCD Centre of Los Angeles and later became the clinical director. Kimberly is on the show today to talk about radical acceptance. So welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to have you on again. Um, It was only a few months ago, right? That we last spoke, I believe. Probably. Although the summer seemed to go fast. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so um, let's get into this idea of radical acceptance, which I believe comes from uh, DBT, di- uh, dialectical behavior therapy, but I'm sure it originally came from somewhere like Buddhism or something like that. So it would be right. good to just explain what it is. Right. So, yeah, it, it's typically a DBT skill, dialectical behavioral therapy, but a lot of DBT is based in mindfulness practice. Um, which, you know, that is why it winds so well with the CBT work that I do because mindfulness is so important with that. But ultimately, um, radical acceptance or radical self-acceptance, depending on where you're directing it, is about a, a total, complete, um, if, you know, when we talk about the word radical, uh, we talk about like absolute to as far a degree as you can acceptance of what is happening and and your experience and when we talk about acceptance really what we're when, when I talk with people about acceptance they usually say but I don't know how to apply that mm. and what acceptance really means is to give consent for the experience and the happening to be with you in this moment you're you're receiving the present moment okay great no that's uh I really like that and what you just said because something that comes up when you know you talk about ex- this idea of acceptance or accepting thoughts, especially in the idea of like act, acceptance, and commitment therapy, people will say, or they, they kind of feel, especially with sort of sexual intrusive thoughts and violent thoughts, if I um, accept them, does that mean I'm agreeing with them? And obviously, it's it's mm-hmm. egotistic. You don't want those thoughts, so the last thing you want to do is agree with them. Um, but guessing that's not what acceptance is. You're not necessarily agreeing with it. Is that right? No. I mean, I think that's the, the biggest error that we as humans make is when we put too much of an emphasis on our intent related to a thought. Um, I'm going to have, even in this session with you, I'm probably going to have all kinds of random, strange thoughts, you know, and, and probably some Delph. Um, some sort of self-deprecating thoughts on, you know, how I will do and 
what terrible catastrophe could happen. Um, the presence of that thought doesn't, and, and my acceptance of that doesn't mean that is my intent, right? Mm. Um, and so I think that's an important point that we all make with our thinking is, and that's that's a really big part of acceptance um, and radical acceptance, which is um, accepting the present and accepting your thoughts about you accepting the present. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's hard to wrap your head around, but but we it's sort of the second layer. So if I said, okay, I want you to accept this present moment, well, then we have to accept our thoughts about what that means and what will happen. Hmm. Yeah. That's radical. Yeah, absolutely. I'm right? trying to get my head around it. <laughs> um, right. Well, think of it. Yeah. Think of it as. Uh, one of the most important pieces of radical self-acceptance or radical acceptance is non-judgment, mm. right? So if I said I'm having a thought about hurting my baby, right, yeah. and then I practiced accepting that, I would have to be non-judgmental about that acceptance. I would have, have to be non-judgmental about the thought and I'd have to be, I wouldn't have, I can't, can't place this meaning on what it means about me if I accept it. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So to, to confirm uh, from my understanding, so it's kind of like I'm not accepting, in the case of OCD, let's say it's a sexual intrusive thought, I'm not accepting the content of that thought. I'm accepting the thought itself, the just the act of mm -hmm. having a thought. I'm allowing it to be there without judging it or attaching to it, that is that kind of radical acceptance, allowing it to be there. It's, it actually has mm -hmm. nothing to do with the content. Um, no. Yeah. No. I mean, that's why we get caught up, right? And we could, what we should do is go through some examples of this because when we have a thought, we get up caught up in not only the presence of it, so like, oh, I shouldn't be thinking that, but then we get caught up in sort of that ego piece which is like well what does that mean about me that I would have that thought yeah. right um, it, the, the radical acceptance is saying I'm going to accept every part about this thought process and I'm going to practice not assigning any meaning to any of it at all I'm going to I mean as it is is the three words that co go so well with radical acceptance yeah as it is is that um i don't know because i used to have i used to have a, a, a i guess a mantra you could say similar to those three words where i would kind of repeat to myself and i know someone's going to pull me up right now and say that's a compulsion it wasn't a compulsion because <laughs> i could have stopped at any time and there was no anxiety around actually doing this but i was doing it because i i I, I did it as a reminder that it just is. This, whatever it is, it's just my experience. It's neither good nor bad. It just is what it is. It was something along those lines. Um, is that the, the, the sort of three words you just said, as it, as it is? Um, do you encourage that type of, I guess, mantra or saying with, with your clients? Mm, I do, um, mainly because... Um, well, well, let me start by saying any client can make anything a compulsion, hmm. right? I, I've had clients who use breathing as a compulsion. You know, anything can become a compulsion, but and only the person can really define whether it's compulsive or not. Yeah. But in general, claiming that this is this moment is what it is is the foundation of us grounding in reality, right? You're you're basically saying. I'm going to experience and observe this moment and I'm not going to get caught up in my own narrative about what that means. Yeah. Right? So if we were to talk about um, like, like self-acceptance when it comes to our physical body, let's say someone has the thought that they're fat or that they are ugly or, you know, mm -hmm. you could go with any of those. Um, the, what I'm saying by self-acceptance or radical acceptance isn't to say I accept that I am fat, yeah. right? Because that doesn't that's not helpful. That's not even accurate in most settings. Mm. It, what it is is it's saying I'm going to radically accept my experience of and my thought of that, and I'm going to work really hard to ground myself that this is my experience as it is. 
right? You, you're an observer to it. It's sort of like um, some people say, like you you elevate to a higher higher level and and see it for really how it is, which is I'm having the thought that that is happening, and I'm going to accept my whole experience of that. I'm not accepting the thought. I'm not accepting it to be true. Um, and then from that moment, you you can ground you can ground and move forward in a way that isn't just going down the narrative of I'm fat and everything that that means yeah absolutely and then you're not getting caught up in the content of the thought and you're not getting mm. in that in the case of OCD in that cycle um, right yeah right another example is often with physical sensations right I talk a lot about radical acceptance when it comes to your physical discomfort so a client will come in and then will say I'm freaking out. Like this is this is bad. Like I can't live like this anymore, or, or whatever it is that their their narrative about their physical sensations. And I could spend a whole session trying to do deep breathing with them, and that would be somewhat helpful, I think. But but what I would prefer to use that time to do is to sit down and go, how can you have a non-judgmental and fully accepting experience of the fact that your heart is racing right now, right? Usually what will happen is the client will say, well, if I don't control it, if I, if I accept it, I'm going to have the biggest panic attack of my life, right? Yeah. But that's, that's the misunderstanding about acceptance. Acceptance is just giving consent to experience something, Right. And when usually when you you give consent to experience that, it becomes less painful, right? Because of the you've taken away the urgency of it, which often elevates anxiety. You've taken away the the severity of it, which often elevates anxiety. Um, you're taking away all of these other factors, and you're just saying, "My anxiety is what it is. How can I exist?" And and then, as you said, with acceptance and commitment therapy. How can I live a life based on my values? Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. And I like what you said just now about pain, because I, when I was doing research for this interview, I um, they came across this quote, which I think was from Marsha Lynham, the creative. Linehan. Linehan. Um, although I'm not sure if it was hers, but people do your research. It was something like <laughs> uh, uh, suffering is optional, pain is not. And I really like that, you know, we, you know, if I, I don't know, kick this uh, table leg, it's going to hurt my foot and that's real. The pain is real. I can't magically think my way out of that. Um, but the, the suffering is up to me to an extent, because if I then, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I kicked that. Oh, it's really hurting. And I keep drawing my attention back. Then I'm suffering and that's optional. Um, right. And I guess that, the, I guess the yeah the the radical acceptance kind of covers that suffering part, right? Right. Well, it's. I mean, now what you're getting into is the very depth of, of Buddhist practice, right? Which mm. is um, the degree in which you are uh, you attach to something is the degree in which you suffer t to something. So if you're really attached to being happy all the time, you're probably going to suffer a lot because of your strong attachment to that um, yeah. and vice. And, the same for if you're attached to not feeling pain, you're going to have a lot of suffering because of that strong bound attachment. Um, the I I can't remember if I've ever mentioned this to you on your podcast before, but I've mentioned it in mine. Is um, the the old Buddhist story about the second arrow? Have I talked to you about that ever? I think I may have heard it, but it'd be good good for you to tell. Right. Me this. It's so helpful to understand judgment. So the, the, pretend you're out in a field and you're a hunter and gatherer, right, back thousands of years, and you're out there and you're in your, you know, doing your your daily job of hunting and gathering, and you get hit with an arrow from the opposite tribe, mm -hmm. right? And you're like, ouch, right? That hurt. I got hit. In the, I always like in my mind, it's like in my leg, right? You just get hit and there's that excruciating pain. That's the first arrow. The second arrow is the judgment you place on yourself about being hit the first time. 
I'm so stupid. How could I have let this happen? I Now the other tribe has one up on me. You know, I, I should have known better. The judgment, the second arrow, is most often more painful than, than the first. Yeah. Right. And so that's the that's why so non judgment is so important with this radical acceptance piece is allowing it to be as it is. And that's so true with our thoughts. Thoughts aren't good or bad. They're just thoughts or they're they're the presence of these words that happen to string together in your brain. And so that non judgment piece is so huge a, a part of the degree in which we suffer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like that story. Um Yeah, definitely in my own life I it's the the act itself, whatever it may be, causes me pain. But then definitely I then have a habit of trying to beat myself up. Uh unintentionally, I must admit, but it still happens. And it's yeah, recently I I've, I've been trying this idea of radical acceptance of just or, or more importantly I use the words just let it go. Uh, which is also the, again kind of a Buddhist saying phrase. Um, just I realize that, that the suffering is coming from my attachment to it. And when I can let it go and, and live with the uncertainties of what may be, what may happen and where, what did, it, it's really uncomfortable. That moment you start to let go and, and it's whether it's OCD or general worries, it, it bombards you more and more and more. And it's, I think a lot of people, and I do it as well, give in in that moment and then go back to ruminating and but if almost if you can live with that heightened anxiety just that tad longer it then goes and right. almost minutes later you're like what was i even worried about and right then, yeah it might come you back. can kind of giggle yeah exactly yeah. yeah 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 no i think that that is really i mean even your process and usually the question that i ask is like well, what, what is preventing us from letting go? It's like there's a, you, if one, someone wants to really answer that question, there's a lot of juicy information about who we are and how we think we have control, yeah. right? It's like, well, let, I, I, I should let go. And then it's like, but I, I don't want to let go because if I let go, maybe I will turn into a pedophile or maybe I will, you know, you know do a terrible thing. Um, and so that's where at the beginning of the session I was talking about um, accepting the presence of whatever discomfort you have and then accepting the, your own acceptance of that, right, which is really just accepting the second arrow, part of the judgment you have about acceptance. Yeah. That makes a little bit more sense. Yeah, it does, absolutely. Um, so when you, when you ask clients, uh, or so you ask them kind of what is preventing you, um, what are the kind of typical answers is there a theme you you find in their answers or is it very varied in what they would respond to that I think I think with OCD there's never a a norm yeah, right yeah. like I'm never shocked <laughs> I'm never shocked but there is probably some generalized themes um, the most common with physical anxiety is I'm afraid that if I accept it it'll get worse yeah right and then alongside accepting that it'll get worse is the fear that they won't be able to handle it, yeah. right? And, and that's where we, again, this it, it gets a little monotonous because I'll go, okay, then you can accept that. And they'll go, but then it'll get worse. And I'll go, and then you'll accept that. And they'll go, and then I'll lose control. I'll go, and then you'll accept that. I mean, that that is how it works. Yeah. You could use more of a mindfulness approach, which is just to observe that, all of that's going to come out yeah. in one big word blob, right, in yeah. your mind. Um, but I think the fear when it comes to physical anxiety, it's often that it'll get worse or they'll panic. Um, often people will feel that if they don't control or they, if they allow acceptance, that something will snap inside them, Yeah. right, that, you know, that, that really the only thing that's holding them together as a human, as a quote-unquote good human, is the, this, con, this hold they have on them, their thoughts and their, themselves. And if they let go and they accept that, well, they're going to snap. And before long, they're going to be, you know, naked running down the street, you know, with frizzy hair. You, you know the imagery we I've have, done that right? Before. <laughs> <laughs> good. Maybe not it's the frizzy hair, but the other part. <laughs> The 
but it's in that snap yeah. way, like, you know, and, and which is so funny. It's actually interesting you mentioned that because what one person feels, what, what a bunch of kids I'm sure last night at some college ran down the street naked because they don't have any attachment to that. There's no suffering there. Yeah. The people who are afraid of that and are attached to not that, now having that happen are in immense amount of pain. Yeah. Um, so it's always, I always sort of like to flip it and be like, well, who actually would be joyful about my fear happening right now? Mm. Right? Like, yeah. well, what if I totally mess up on the podcast? Well, who would be totally thrilled to be on a podcast right now? Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so the fear of snapping is a huge one, I think. And I think, I think anyone with anxiety can somewhat resonate with that because um, we're all just trying not to make a massive mistake. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, another theme, particularly more when it's body focused, is the fear that you'll just let yourself go. Right. Yeah. Like if I don't, con- particularly with eating disorders, if I accept my body the way that it is, well, I'll probably turn into a slob and stop taking care of myself. And and and, and with each one of these fears, you can hear the attachment piece. Right. Which is their fear is of losing control of their body, yeah. right, in whatever form, whether it's physically or in their actions. Um, but that's a really big one when I talk about it with the BDD clients and the eating disorder clients is I'm afraid I'll just, you know, stop caring, yeah. right? Um, and I think, but, but ultimately, acceptance is just a practice of uncertainty. And who really likes that? <laughs> you know, it's not no one loves uncertainty it's an uncomfortable experience so most people are just resistant because you know why would I choose uncertainty when I could attempt for certainty yeah yeah that makes sorry go now even if that the attempt for certainty ends up ruining their lives yeah that's the uh, twisted irony of it right um right the yeah the (laughs) The things we do to protect ourselves sometimes end up hurting us more <laughs> than the fear. Um, right. More often than not, I yeah. think. Right. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's the talk, when I talk with clients about acceptance, it's sometimes really helpful to talk about people's relationship with the word. Right. Because, you know, sometimes it's, it's just more about the word. And if we can find a different way, I, I had one client who really loved choose love, not fear. Right. Which and that was that was, uh, other, you know, we could go AKA otherwise known as radical acceptance. Yeah. Right. That she didn't chose not that was the, the mantra she took, you know, yeah. choose love, not fear. Um, and that was her way of radically accepting that this is what it is and I'm going to move forward with my intention. Yeah. Right. Um, other people might say allow or um, let go. They're all ultimately similar you know, in, yeah. in their meaning, but find something that works for you. I like radical acceptance because it kind of feels a little bit badass. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, and, and for those who struggle with con- like needing control, like the whole bring it on radical acceptance approach yeah. feels more, um, grasp, graspable. I don't think that's a word, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can use it. Yeah, I think it's um yeah, you're you you're kind of taking how it feels for me anyway. You're taking more ownership. Right. You're like your right. acceptance is like I it, it always feels to me a bit uncertain and not in the good way. Whereas right. like radical acceptance is like no, I'm deciding to do this. This is right. a conscious choice and I'm not going to be pushed around anymore. Like right. yeah. Right. When I first heard the term radical acceptance was from Tara Brock, who is probably like my favorite author and pod, like she has a wonderful podcast and she's very just wonderful, wonderful human. And um, the thing that immediately my undergraduate was in science and the thing that really came to me was a free radical. Like I don't think of like radicals like um, like political radical. I think of like a free radical, which is like an atom that spreads and just goes over and destroys you know what I mean but I for some reason that resonates with me of like I feel like it's a rebellious thing to radically accept you know like I'm going to radically accept this you know what I mean like I'm not gonna 
I'm not going to choose fear. I'm going to radically take my whole body and just take go with this. For me, that resonates for me. But for other people, you could you could do it however you wanted. But ultimately, the practice can. I always say with like my kid clients, it can loosen the weight of your backpack significantly. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I agree. And uh, I think that's right. The the idea of uh, well acceptance in its very nature to well, at least in the Western society is very radical because we live in a in a definitely in the UK and I'm sure in the States and Australia and Canada and all the other countries listening um th- you know getting stuck in your thoughts whether you have OCD anxiety whatever it is we all get stuck in our thoughts from time to time no matter who you are and we we've all believed that thoughts are important we've all been taught that when reality we decide if they're important or at least that's how it should be we we say whether we're going to pay attention or not and accepting is very radical it's Mm. um yeah Uh, and uh okay so so i'm actually going to get to my questions now because that was all freestyled Uh, (laughs) can i add one thing yeah of course I think that with acceptance, for for me and for a lot of my clients I've seen, when you do accept too, not only do you have a sense of um, of like it, you're taking taking your life back, but it slowly decreases the feelings of depression too, mm. because you don't feel like if you're totally getting beaten up by your thoughts, and you're basically at the mercy of your thoughts. If you have good ones, you're a good person. If you have bad ones, you're a bad person. Um, that's a very depressing place to live. But when, when you take on an, a place of radical acceptance, I feel like it's the best insurance policy for depression, right? Because mm-hmm. you're saying, um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to wait, raise, rate myself on my thoughts anymore. Yeah. Right. So that's just another little, like I said, a little side bonus. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure radical yeah. acceptance, where it's self-esteem as well, or obviously that can play into depression, um, confidence, yeah, giving a speech, you know, accepting, radically accepting, I'm terrified right now, and that's okay. Right. Um, okay, good. So, uh, let me find the question. Okay, so um, we've kind of answered this but I thought we could spend a bit more time on it is how radical acceptance is useful in OCD recovery um yeah just I know we've covered this a bit but any more detail would be awesome right um so think of it think of I mean if I were to give a blanket statement I would say radical acceptance like we we talked about is complete it's the complete package right if I told yeah. marketing it would be like the best deal ever it takes it it goes over everything but cuz ultimately what it's talking about is it's addressing accepting of your thoughts which we know with OCD yeah. is a is a hurdle yeah it's accepting of your physical discomfort which we know with any anxiety is a you know is a is a problem if if someone had a thought and there was an anxiety we would let it go easier i think yeah. but the presence of that nagging chest tightness or you know for me it's like the back of my arms just feel like i feel like i'm gonna explode right it's like if the presence of that makes it really difficult so accepting the physical discomfort um, is a huge part of your ocd treatment and then in addition to that it's accepting whatever feelings emotions show up as well right it you know because it's ocd isn't just about fear it's also about sadness and irritability and and you know all of those sort of very difficult emotions wrapped into a big bundle so the cool thing is it's a tool you can use with everything right yeah um but if if i were to move to a more clinical style if no matter what you do with exposure therapy and with your response prevention if you're insisting on not letting go of, you know, uncertainty, letting go of certainty, excuse me, and if you're if you are clinging, your treatment's not going to be as successful, right? The real the real letting it be there, allowing the world to just do what it does as it is, right? 
is where the real gold is in exposure therapy, right? I mean, if we were to do an exposure where I said, okay, you and I are going to go and we're going to touch, um, we're going to touch the doorknob at Starbucks. If you weren't accepting to some degree, it wouldn't get done. Yeah. Right. And that's where gradual exposure is so beautiful because I could say, all right, I'll touch the doorknob, but I, I'll wash my hands in half an hour. That just means there's some acceptance and not a large degree of acceptance, but that's still good. Yeah. Right. That's still a step that there, you know, as much as people, this might be new to some people, you practice acceptance in your life all over the place. Right. Mm. Just being a human, we have, we have to accept a million things. You know, I have to accept that my chair won't fall apart and I have to accept that, you know, the internet's going to hold on for this, this session with you, you know, we're already doing it. But like I said, the definition of acceptance is the consent, it, the consent to, to receive whatever is happening. Yeah. It's a huge part of exposure therapy. Yeah. As I said, a big source of my anxiety on this podcast is either the connection we were having some issues before and it, it's a fear of if it goes out, then I have to edit it. Uh, it ruins the flow. It happens if the sounds patchy. Uh, so and then and then I'm like, okay, I'm not even paying attention anymore. So I have to. Keep <laughs> it. And it's yeah, again, accept that. Well, it may happen. If it does, I'll deal with it. Um, okay, is it okay so far? It's been I actually mean, it's I been better. I should, okay. <laughs> I didn't I want to say because I didn't want to jinx it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I've done it now. Um, we well, yeah. Okay, so I was actually uh, talking with Ben. You brought something back for me. Um, talking about the clients, and when I asked you about, I can't remember how I asked it, but you said that they would keep saying, yeah, but then what about this? If I accept that, then what about this? And you say, well, you accept that. And um, Are there any tech, because that's kind of the million-dollar question, right? It's almost, I, I always kind of say it's like a leap of faith. Sometimes letting go is jumping and hoping that, you know, your parachute opens the wall. There's another edge that you land on. You don't fall down a chasm. It, it does feel like that leap of faith. Um, and I'm guessing, judging from what you said, you, uh, like gradual exposure, there could be gradual acceptance, you could call it, mm. as in like, so, you know, anyone listening who's got real bad fear of contamination, obviously trying to let that go and radically accept that may be too overwhelming to start with. But I'm sure there's other areas in their life that aren't affected by OCD where they could practice radically accepting in those areas and then develop a skill. Um, right. I'm guessing, A, does that work? And B, uh, is there anything else that you can get them to kind of take that sort of leap? Right. So one thing I want to make sure no one has um, misunderstood is what I'm not saying mm. is let just let it go. Yeah. There's nothing more un like takes away your own validation than for someone to say, let it go, right? Like, mm. can't you, why can't you let it go? And, and that's definitely not what I'm, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, it's not in an attempt to say, suck it up in, in any form. Um, but yes, absolutely. Now, we, there is actual scientific research to show that, um, and I don't endorse this for everybody, but that they showed on, I think it was dog phobias, that exposing people to height fears, let's say if you had a dog phobia and a height phobia, that by doing the work on the height phobia, you can actually desensitize some of your dog phobia, yeah. right, by doing the work in another area. And I'm sure because with all exposure requires some acceptance, I'm sure that that is true, that you can you can just play around with it. And I love the idea of playing around with it. Like even for me, if I'm anxious to go to say, what else could I be worrying about? Not that I'm inviting that, but just like it's really just an inquiry of really the, the problem is I'm focused on this one problem. I could be worried about my chair falling apart or not having my next meal or whatever it might be. Um, it, it helps me to sort of, again, get to a higher altitude and look at things a little different, um, more differently. But um, absolutely, ex you know, we could, I'm, I'm, I don't know if any of there's research, but I'm sure we could come up with a, a thesis proposal on acceptance hierarchy, right? Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's some, some benefit to that, you know, and we could put it into practice ourselves and I'm sure we'd see a benefit. I think even just talking about, acceptance and considering it opens up our 
uh, takes away the clasping and the grasping on, you know, n- not hurt, not having any pain in our life. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I was just talking about it opens up, it opens up different possibilities and different, you know, the world could be like this for me. And uh, it doesn't have to be the way I've been living. Um, thoughts don't have to be fact. They can, in fact, right. just be, you know, nonsense. Um, right. Yeah. Right. I, I think it just opens up that part of your brain where curiosity lives. Yes. Right. Like, ah, OK, that's interesting. That thought just showed up for me. I'm going to accept that that one's there. But what else have you got for me? What else have I, you know, there's a curiosity to that instead of a clinging and a, and a you know, a suppressing. And, a, you know, that's two completely different experiences. Yeah, I think that's good. I think uh, I think we could probably do a podcast on curiosity as well. Because I think when you're curious, it's hard to be fearful. It's hard to be scared. Um, because I guess th- fear is often a very... Um, black and white thing it's it's when people will uh, can speak for myself when i'm scared the fear is that it's going to happen uh whether it's an ocd thing or just a general fear um but if i i never remind myself maybe i should to be more curious to be like yeah. okay well why am i scared or you know what is the fear what and try and break it down um, right because different parts of the brain right so it's switching right I mean, that's the, that's a Buddhist, um, uh, when I talk about Buddhists, I'm talking philosophy, not yes. religion so yeah. much, but that's the, what they call the beginner's mind. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the I beginner's mind. Is Pardon? One, no one's going to see because I haven't got uh, the video on, but I'm holding up, uh, a piece of paper with the symbol beginner's mind on, um, right. is it Shoshin? Is that how you say it? Yeah. yeah. Shoshin, yeah. So I got this from the book you recommended, which I'm going to forget, but maybe you can the beginner's mind is Zen. Yeah. 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 Zen mind, beginner's That's mind. It. Yeah. Yeah. But beginner's mind is basically like, Oh, like this is a pen. What does it feel like? You know, mm. interesting, yeah. you know, it's taking a different approach. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. And I, I try to, I'm trying to apply this as well in my own life where I feel currently I've somewhat mastered an area. I'm trying to get myself in the beginner's mind because then that stops me being sometimes yeah. arrogant and keeps me open-minded to learning. Um, yeah, it's tricky. Um, it's so important when yeah. we're talking about thoughts because look at anyone who's t- labeled a th- any thought as bad, Yeah, you're coming from a place where you think you're right. Yeah. And you're probably, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say you're not. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the, the thought, you know, I could think about the most heinous thought right now and it won't, I, I'm not going to assign it bad, hmm. right? I'm yeah. going to assign it thought. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if thoughts are real, then I'd be able to move that bottle in front of me. Uh, <laughs> which, <laughs> uh, that like, would be the coolest party trick ever. That would. It's a shame we're doing a <laughs> podcast because no one would see it. Um, <laughs> okay, so... Uh, is there any because I know in your pod the thing I really like about your podcast is you do a lot of guided meditations um and it got me thinking about how I could do it but maybe into the future but I wanted to see if you had any guided meditations for radical acceptance um it's I'm actually in the process of doing a radical acceptance podcast but so it will be there in the future yeah but the I, I, you know, when I reflected on on this a few weeks ago, um, my heart keeps taking me back to the yes meditation, which is in my podcast, because saying a gentle, quiet yes is radical acceptance. Um, and, and for those who haven't heard it, a yes meditation is to just be very present and notice your surroundings. And as you observe it, you just gently say yes. You're, you're, you're saying yes to my, my tight chest. You're saying yes to like outside of my office is the highway. I'm saying yes to that small hum of, of traffic. I'm saying yes to the, the light coming down on me. It, it's a, it is a yes meditation. So, um, I think for, for future, I'll create more to be related to accepting whatever you're feeling, but I love the yes meditation. I think that, I think again, it takes 
away that that sort of naggy uncertain feeling and it there's a there's an intention there of saying yes i'm gonna it's that same kind of badass kind of feeling of like yeah. yes i'm i'm gonna feel that so i'm a real big i love the yes meditation yeah so that's that's uh yes to everything right good or bad uh mm-hmm. yeah I think I think that's also a good point is, um, you know, doing the research for this interview, it reminded me of it's about not being attached to the good thoughts as well sometimes mm. um, because it's still attachment. Right. Um, and obviously, and then and then you can choose when to be attached to good thoughts or bad. Sometimes maybe you want to be attached to them for whatever reason. But Right. Um, right. I, I usually yeah. say to people, work at – at not attaching to the absence of negative thoughts first. Okay. Um, be, be, because people with OCD, if, if, I, um, if I worked on both, yeah. it gets overwhelming and confusing. So I say let's first work at accepting your what you have claimed to be bad, right? Yeah. Quote, unquote, bad. Yeah. Um, let's first accept the, the negative and then, then you can take on the positive. If you do it the opposite way, what I've seen is there becomes sort of this clinging to positive because there's still so many compulsions caught up in that mental thought. Yeah. Um, it can get a little overwhelming. So I always stay with the negative, but you're absolutely right. A real advanced training is to have it non, non, you know, non judge, non attachment to anything. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> it's challenging. Um, so maybe me being a bit anal, um, what, uh, tempo and frequency do you kind of say yes at when you're sitting there or standing okay so i'll say it out loud okay so i would take a deep breath always first and then i would breathe out usually my out breath is a little longer and then i'd say yes and then i'd take a deep breath in and i would breathe out a little bit longer and I would say yes, but I love a whisper because okay. there's something peaceful about the just saying it out loud enough to where the wind hears you, but not to where your neighbor would. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I like that. And um, your breathing, obviously it doesn't matter too much, but I know people have preferences and uh, do you breathe through the nose and out through the nose or do you use the um, I do. Yeah. I do. I, I had to think about it for a second. Yeah. Um, I breathe, I breathe sort of in through the nose and in through the mouth and then breathe. I, I think I do like a mix. <laughs> yeah. But I think it really, for me, it could, it, I think the reason that I had to sort of check in is if I'm anxious, it's different to when I'm calm. Yeah. And I really try not to get too um, caught up in my rules about that because then it distracts my thinking. To being, I'm, I've, I've got to the point now where I really just try to ground myself in the absolute surroundings and my, my, the whole, like I try to just look down at myself, um, from above. And if I'm thinking about my breath, I'm thinking about my breath, (laughs) which is not what I want. But, um, I I I think the truth is it doesn't matter for too much. Okay, cool. Uh, Good to know. Um, and my last a question really is um, what's one area in your life recently that you've had to apply radical acceptance? Oh, that's a good question. Okay. So um, I think it's very much related to the conversation we were having is I, um, I started my podcast really as sort of a hobby, but I wanted to just reach a couple of people who I knew who were suffering you know, and, and it wasn't, I don't still don't think of myself as a quote unquote podcaster. Right. Um, and so it's weird for me if I had to like write a description, I wouldn't be, I don't know if I'd feel comfortable writing that, which is strange, the ego thing of mine. But recently I've been, been asked to be on several different people's podcasts and which means I have to give up control of the content. Right. Yeah. And I really base my practice. I'm, I try to be as congruent and consistent as I can be on my podcast and when I'm talking with other people. And then I went on a podcast where it was just a different vibe to what I'm used to. It was wonderful, but way more lo- jokey and funny and, and abrupt. And it's, it threw me off. And I had to really practice accepting that the world will catch me. In fact, 
I have an app on my phone that is sort of like a little bit of a mantra reminder. Whatever I'm going through, I can put in just little reminders. And I had to just keep saying, let the world catch you, right? Like accept that you, you can't control everything all the time. So that was a big thing for me. I mean, I always think of Brene Brown where she yeah. says, you can't criticize someone who's, who, if you're in the ring, no one can criticize you unless they're in the ring with you. Yeah. Right. And so that was the big thing. I, and, and that was a, uh, I can't tell you, uh, such an overwhelming acceptance of, I have to literally accept that everyone can judge, will judge me differently. Or, you know, they'll think whatever they think, which can be really, you know, oh, my God, it hurt me to every single bone. (laughs) I had to hold on so strong for like 48 hours on that one. It was like a it was like a 48 hour acceptance marathon. It felt like. Yeah. I was uh, I know you through it. Do you feel? Oh, I'm totally through it now. Yeah. Again. And the cool thing, like you said before, is what a. What a confidence booster. To, if you can sit through it, if you can sit through that ride of, I have to just accept this, mm. you come out on the other end. And I, I felt a couple of inches taller but a few days later. Like, you know what? Yeah, I can, I can, I'm going to let people think what they think. I, I'm going to, I'm going to do the best I can and I'll be of service as much as I can to my, my OCD community and my eating disorder community. And the, let the haters be haters if there yeah. is any. But there weren't any. No, there never are. <laughs> <laughs> it's just my head went for about 48 hours on this. Yeah. I was saying, yeah, yeah. Your, your head is your biggest hater sometimes. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, that, that's good. Um, I say, what was the app you mentioned? Uh, let me it? tell you. It is, it's, actually, it's called um, Affirmation. I can tell you, it's just, it won't tell me. It's called Affirmation, but I think it has a different name. It's just not showing it to me. Let me see. All right, cool. Oh, we can uh, put the link in the show notes or, yeah, we'll dig it out. The cool thing is you can just set up alerts on your phone through your calendar, which is what I used to always do. This one's cool because you have to press it five times for it to go away. Ah, yeah, that's good. And so you're supposed to say it five times out loud. So, like... Um, yeah, you can, and you can put in whatever you want. Yeah, no, that, that, that's good. I, say, I saw a, an alarm clock the other day, which was like a, a mat that you put by the bed and it goes off and you have to stand on it for 30 seconds to switch it off. Oh. So for anyone who struggles to wake up in the morning, <laughs> then that's, to, I, which I do, so I was considering it. Um, it was quite pricey, though. That was the only thing. Um, uh, and you can have the ones yeah. with wheels, and the longer it goes off, the more the it rolls away from your bedroom. Oh, wow. Yeah, a client of mine invested. It, the wheels are like um, maybe 20 centimeters in diameter. Yeah. It's like a, a beastie time machine. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Um, so another thing that came out for me then when you were talking about, when you mentioned Brene Brown and being in the ring or the arena and uh, no one has the right to criticize you unless they're they're there too um it the thing that came up for me was this idea of permission uh, and sometimes giving yourself permission whether it's to fail or to make mistakes or to feel fear whatever it is or to be criticized for me that's a big one i hate criticism I don't mind constructive criticism, but if someone's adamantly against me for whatever reason, I really take it personally. Like, I need them to like me. Uh, and for me, that's where I apply radical acceptance. But more recently, it's also about giving myself permission to not be liked by everyone. That's okay. Mm-hmm. I don't need. Um, right. Is that, yeah, is giving permission part of the acceptance piece? Well, and it's that's another beautiful example of a synonym for acceptance. I mean, if we go back to sort of like my, my um, definition is, again, it's like consent to receive whatever is in this moment. And, and us giving permission is consent, right? Um, yeah. And so it's that same, it's the same to- concept. And that's why I love having those conversations with clients on what is the wording that feels right for you? What is this, where is the safety in this for you? And how can we 
work it to where, you know, radical acceptance might, that might not resonate with someone at all, but it's absolutely about permission. It's, I was saying, you know, it was so important for, with me a few weeks ago, I had a client who said, after actually listening to a podcast that I was interviewed on, said, wrote me an email and said, for after listening, I'm going to give myself permission to have these thoughts from now on. Mm. Yeah. Right? So powerful. It, that's exposure therapy and, and mindfulness all rolled into one. Yeah. Right? It's cool. So cool. Yeah, yeah. Hearing you say it like that, yeah, it does perfectly align with acceptance. It's just that letting go and allowing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's an empowerment in the yes. word permission though, I think. There is like again, that's that that's that I, I hope it's okay for me to say badass. That's yeah, okay, it's right? Fine, yeah. S swear <laughs> so away. <laughs> so that's that badassiness yeah. of saying, No, I'm actually going to uh, take I'm not gonna let anxiety run the show. Yeah. I'm gonna let my value run the show. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna give myself permission or I'm going to allow this or whatever, you know you could even go online i had a client who once um googled like synonyms for acceptance because they were adamant they didn't want to use that word yeah. just find whatever works for you that's fine as if, as long as it there is a a non-clinging and a non-grasping involved you you're good hmm. yeah that's very true i mean words are just words right and if a different word gets you to the same place then that's fine right um right yeah Okay, great. Uh, is, is there anything uh, you you want to share that I haven't asked you about to do radical acceptance that you feel is worth sharing? Mm. Um, the only thing I would add is there's two, two distinctions here. One is radical acceptance, which is a broad acceptance of your experience and everything that's out of your control, which is ultimately most everything, but that's other people's opinions and, and how people will act and experience you. So that's one thing. But then on the flip, there's also radical self-acceptance, which um, tends to be more triggering for a lot of people because it's, it's, it goes deep into accepting yourself on the deepest level, the most faulty, imperfect level, which I think as a human race, um, we struggle with. Yeah. Um, and so the reason I make those two distinctions is I think equal, they're equal of importance, right? That, that you accept your outside surroundings, but they're all, you, I really always want people to come back to, um, you know, usually a fear is always, what does it mean about me? Yeah. Right. And so it's going back to that self-acceptance, which is, I am who I am, you know, be here now and keeps taking a step forward. And that's really all we can do. That is acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the only thing I really want to emphasize. You know, the self-acceptance piece I usually brings out many more tears than the basic acceptance piece. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, we could all love ourselves a little bit more. Um, mm. I saw a really good acronym today on Instagram. It's something about you're happy or the world's better when you when you learn to fly and f l y stood for something it was something like it was love yourself but i can't remember the what well, the f stood for but it was basically this idea of like completely loving yourself when you like fully maybe fully yeah but when you fully love yourself everything becomes easier yeah yeah, yeah. i love that yeah. i i really do i mean and and it, I think people, I think our reaction to that is like, oh, that's a little like girly or cliche or whatever it might be. But it's like, no, I really hear the words. Like mm. if, if you were to be okay with yourself, you would, um, the wrestle you have with your thoughts probably would be a little easier. Yeah. Right. Particularly if you have OCD. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very true. And I think, um, you know, we, uh, the other way I, I would look at, for me anyway, about loving yourself is it's a little arrogant. That's kind of the negative belief in my head. Like, who are you to love yourself? You kind of, or at least in my culture, it's like, are you full of yourself? Or you got a big head yeah. or a big ego? You're not going to fit through the door with a head that big or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, it's almost, we are doing ourselves a disservice but it's uh, 
there's a quote that comes to mind. I don't, know if, I don't know if I'll quote it, but we we love our spouses or our girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, husband, wife. We love our best friends. We love our mom or dad or children, whatever it is, and often unconditionally, and we do anything for them and we put them on a pedestal. Uh, it's almost like who are we not to do that to ourselves mm, like right. almost how dare we <laughs> do that right. for others but neglect ourselves because we right. deserve that as much as the people we're giving that to right right yeah it's interesting because that's very much um from my experience australian culture too mm. like you don't brag and and be very careful when you get to like excited for yourself on yeah. things and I think that that does build some resilience and some um you're um what's the word I'm thinking of like you're grounded yeah. and you're um humble. you know you're down to earth yeah yeah humble is the word thank you um and so it has many benefits but anytime we place a strict belief system on something Mm. There's always a shadow side to that, you know. Yeah. Anytime we ground something, there's you also have to go. Well, what is the what's the repercussion of that? And so I agree. Yeah, if you're if you self accept to the degree which you aren't open to other people, well, that's really not self acceptance anyway. Yeah. That's it's just <laughs> that's that's again attachment to yeah. you being good, yeah. right? That's creating just a whole number. It, it's where we as humans are just these flowing objects we can so it's like what unless you're holding that to be true all the time no go ahead and feel good about yourself I just had a conversation with a client yesterday and he said well isn't that kind of selfish and I'm like yeah let's just allow selfishness to be ex in your experience let's allow the thought that you're selfish and go take care of yourself right yeah. like I'm cool with that allow a little bit of that in your life and you probably will thrive absolutely right. and uh and it and you have more to give as well right you know you have more energy or you're, you're more comfortable with yourself so you can give more love or give it more freely um so in a way being somewhat selfish is the most unselfish thing you could do right yeah. right i and that was the example i gave is um i after a day of work i wish i wasn't this way but i'm usually taxed hmm. and i'm not the best person to hang out with I, I want to be but I'm just not yeah. and it's sad because I want to be there and be there for my kids but I'm not and what and what I used to do is I go well I should I'm gonna have to suck it up and then I was grumpy and not happy so what I decided to do was to have a baby come on three nights a week and she bathes my kids yeah. I felt guilty why wouldn't I want to bathe my own kids that's terrible you haven't seen them all day but as soon as they're done I am and I've had 20 minutes to myself I'm the happiest person I'm so thrilled to see them yeah. so this the quote-unquote selfishness once I accepted that I needed that mm. it, it everyone's happier yeah absolutely right yeah so, yeah it's a huge piece of self-awareness as well um, right yeah right. Yeah, knowing yeah. knowing yourself, and and then obviously it's better for your kids because you're not going to snap at them, you're not going to be right. distant or grumpy, which could probably cause problems for them later on. If, right. if when they see you, you're happy to see them. That's going to be conducive right. to good work, uh, mental well being. Right. right, but I only got there through accepting. Yeah, it really, it is what it is. There's nothing you can't. There's nothing you can do to make this better unless you you actually look at the real problem. Yeah, it's very true. Okay, cool. Uh, we're, we're, we'll cut it there because I think I've always will keep going for ages and we know we've got to <laughs> record another one which will be live next week, guys. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming on and talking about radical acceptance. My pleasure. I hope it's helpful. Yeah. Cool. If it's not, I'll accept it. <laughs> true. <laughs> So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that episode. I certainly learned a lot just chatting with Kimberly on this topic. Uh, it certainly made me think about how I apply radical acceptance to my own life. Um, but a quick disclaimer, this podcast is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. I wish you best of luck in your recovery. I believe in you and I will speak to you soon. <laughs>